Uh, morning, everybody. So Chris and I have been asked to talk a little bit about echo and cardiogenic shock. Um, and as you know, during the induction, we spend a fair bit of time going over focused echo. And I think most people working for the service would be relatively comfortable with achieving these four sort of basic echo views and, and asking those simple focused questions. So absolutely qualitative. Is the heart beating? Getting an idea of sort of a global assessment of contractility, looking for pericardial effusion and saying, is, is there signs of tamponade and having a look at the various different chamber sizes. And that's useful to a point, but there's a lot of other stuff. And hopefully by the end of today, we can just look at how we can take things a little bit further because there's there's not just focused questions, there's a diagnosis at the end of all of this. And you're not going to pick up all of these diagnoses just by asking those specific questions. And it, it does kind of matter because sometimes treatment changes and sometimes destination changes. And they're decisions that our teams are, are often required to make. So think of those four basic questions, but we're going to take each one of those questions just a little bit further. Is the heart beating or not can stay as is? But then that assessment of contractility, you know, so which chamber is affected? Is the contractility impairment global or is it regional? And can we sort of start to make an assessment of how bad that impairment of contractility is? And then looking at effusions, is it anechoic? Is it hyperechoic? What are our treatment options and what's the underlying pathology and how does that affect our treatment? And then looking at those chamber sizes, looking at their size, looking at the wall, and then trying to think about some of the other things like the valves and the vessels coming out from the heart. This was one of Rob's recent copy and case snippets, which is one of Cliff's algorithms, because we are constantly tasked to go and see patients who are shocked and are either shocked and failing to respond to treatment or are going on escalating numbers and types of vasoactive medications. So we're talking about echo. So we can assume that five of these six are ticked off. I would encourage you all to do this. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> when we're going to see these patients, the other things are squared away by reading the blood gas and looking at the ventilator. We have to be putting an echo probe on all these patients. So we're going to go through some case-based stuff and some audience participation, please. I'm going to ask you some questions. And this is this is tricky stuff. Remember the next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's frozen. Yeah, it's frozen. <laughs> no. um, I've lost my train of thought. I'm distracted <laughs> by the image. Dis is distracted by the image in front of me. <laughs> yeah, you can watch this again if you want. <laughs> um, some audience participation. This is difficult. Um, Echocardiography is a specific specialty. There's someone employed in hospital to do that. We can't perform echo to that level, but we can really look at some qualitative things. So let's go through some cases. So this is the first case. This is a 50-year-old male. Um, <laughs> this is, uh, sorry. This is a 50-year-old uh, male, P1, Canterbury to Concord, past history of hypertension, and an acute onset of dyspnea and hemoptysis. He's got severe pulmonary edema, and there's a, a modest chop rise, of a sort of unclear significance. So he's shocked, hypotensive, cold, and clammy. He's that patient we've seen in those slides earlier. But because we've done all the other things on that alpaca uh, mnemonic, we do an echo. And this is the echo. Let's so just let it play for a little bit. Any? We needed the mood lighting there. The phone and volunteer to take the microphone to talk us through their interpretation of these two. Please. Oh. oh. How's that? That's good. Yeah. 
Anyone want to talk us through it? But if not, then I can start asking you those focus questions. And you'd like to comment first on the contractility then. Normal, abnormal? Good contractility, normal. Is there an effusion? Relative chamber sizes? Relatively normal. Anything else going on? Scott's going to go to so that again. On the right side of the apical four chamber image, his mitral valve looks like it's sort of bowing into the left atrium. So I'd be worried about a mitral valve uh, rupture, uh, a cordial rupture potentially. Yeah, cool. So that is exactly what this patient has. So it's really challenging, but we're going to go through it in a little bit more of a stepwise way now, but this patient presented with acute mitral regurgitation. So lots of causes that we don't need to go through, but you mentioned pap muscle rupture um, can be caused just by regional wall motion abnormalities, endocarditis, rheumatic heart disease, progression of chronic valvular disease. And that presentation with dyspnea, hemoptysis, with the sudden pressure of volume overload is common, as well as this really quite unusual x-ray on the left-hand side of the screen with unilateral pulmonary edema and pulmonary hemorrhage due to the, the relative um, sort of direction of the regurgitant jet. So we'll take a step back because we've all done lots of normal echoes on each other and we've looked at normal valves. So wh what do we think of the valves here? Just anyone tell us what do they look like just use some qualitative sort of descriptive terms they're opening and they're shutting yeah really good so they're opening symmetrically they're opening all the way up and they're coming together and shutting anything else the level of the valve annulus is going up and down and they're thin, they're not lumpy. Yeah, so they're, they're thin, they're pliable, they open and close. Like si simple symmetric, simple qualitative terms. And you know, we mentioned the valve analyst level going up as well, because we're looking for, I guess, evidence of anything else that could be going on that could be associated with those disease processes. And you mentioned there was nothing stuck to them. So where, where would you see uh, a vegetation? Yeah, what's, what side of the valve do they like to hang out on? It's the low pressure side. So they like to hang out on the low pressure side. That's a more hospitable place. So, you know, just little nuggets of qualitative stuff that you can put into your assessment. Because th this is a bit more complex. But this is achievable by us. What view is this? Yes, yeah, so apical four chamber. So acute mitral regurgitation. This is the best view. You're going to underestimate it otherwise. We all know where the color box is on the eye is. So what you just need to do is put the color box over the valve and over the chamber you think there's regurgitation into. If that color, that jet, that really bright jet, fills half of that box or comes down to the back wall of the atria, then that regurgitation is severe. So this person's got severe regurgitation and you've achieved it with one view so it, like it's tricky we're not echo experts but this we carry the kit to do this and we can do this but we might just break it down and just get the proper jet there just so we can highlight what bit of color is the jet yeah sure. there's lots of different color flowing in different directions but you've got this jet blast coming through from the mitral valve down and as you said, it's in the back wall of the left atrium. So that's the regurgitant jet that we can see coming through the valve and across in the wrong direction. So we're happy with that. It's pretty tricky that, isn't it? But 
we went through our focus questions, everything else was normal. We noticed an abnormality through qualitative assessment because we know what a normal valve should look like. And then we put color over one view and it's allowed us to, to differentiate the severity. So should this patient still go Canterbury to Concord? No. They are correct. Yeah, the, the, the contractility, I agree, and this is, is remarkably reduced, but that, that is correct. But the answer to your question, no, that should be going to Concord. Where are we going to go instead? Uh, yeah. yeah. How are we going to manage them? What's the optimization of someone with acute mitral regurgitation? So they're pretty shocked, weren't they? If we go back to uh, if we go back to the presentation, oh, I went too far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hypotensive. Look at that diastolic BP as well. Super low. Anyone want to tell us about the medical optimization of this patient? because you don't want to stretch their annual start and worsen your regage. Um, they need a reasonable heart rate because they need to maintain output. Um, they don't care about AF, that's fine. It's regage. Um, contractility they need to maintain because you need good cardiac output. But the more you increase contractility, the more you'll increase their MR as well. Um, and you don't want afterload, you want to reduce their afterload because the more afterload they have, the more of it's going to go back into the left atrium rather than down the aorta. So what agents would you uh, think about in this situation? Um, well, their blood pressure sucks. So you're in this difficult place of not wanting too much afterload but wanting to increase their BP. What was their heart rate and stuff again? 98. That's perfect. That's fine. Um, Mm, tough. Are they talking? Yeah. I, I think that's kind of important, isn't it? Because the, the definitive therapy is surgical. It's a surgical emergency. The treatment is surgical and all the other stuff is temporizing. <laughs> What's that, Jeff? Say another? Four fast and four. <laughs> so yeah, they, need a, they need a little bit of they need a little bit of preload if they want to do better with the heart, the heart, faster heart rate and they need less. So from memory, and this is a long time ago, full fast and forward was one of the acronyms they used to tell us in cardiac anesthesia for a valve rupture, and it's to give them a bit of preload to keep their heart rate up and slow them down, and to reduce their afterload if you can to allow forward flow. Um, uh, but, but again, it, it probably relates to a couple of other cardiac conditions. Yeah, full fast and forward I have in my head for this. Anything else? Say this was in Concord going to PA. Any other therapies that are sometimes used for acute MR? Balloon pump, afterload reducer might actually be one of the more sort of solid indications for balloon pump treatment that we do. <laughs> All right. I don't know about you guys, but the last two pulmonary edemas that I've had to intubate that haven't responded to all our other therapies have been with these types of echoes, including the this case. It's just so florid that you haven't been able to manage them with other non-invasive means. So that could be a bit tricky. Cool. I was just wondering out loud, um, what's um, CPAP or PEP going to do to this person? I mean, they've got pulmonary edema, haven't they? They, 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 they need that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, second case. Happy to move on? Cool. It's P1, inter-hospital transfer ride to North Shore. So this is a 52-year-old female presented with chest pain, diaphoresis, dyspnea, and she's shocked. Abnormal ECG, so ST elevation in V3 to 6 and lead 2 but without Q waves or reciprocal change, 
that she's being transferred in the middle of the night for urgent angiography and her blood pressure and heart rate are as shown there. So blood pressure 72 on 42 and a heart rate of 102. And you've ticked off all of your other things on the alpaca um, checklist. So you do an echo. And this is the echo. Who would like to talk us through this? Something that Jimmy may have mentioned when I was out of the room. I think it's really important when you put these probes on in these cases is to have a mental image of what you think the heart's going to look like before you put the probe on the skin. You know, you've got this image of someone with ischemic ECG, cardiogenic shock. What do you think that echo is going to look like? And then when you put the probe on, were you expecting it to look like this? I think is a really helpful tool in that qualitative assessment um, that we're using. Yeah. yeah, so I think there are problems on the left side. Um, the left ventricle is large, the left atrium is large. Um, to my eye, the apex looks um, like it's con contracting less um, than the LV more proximally. Um, so I'd be thinking about something like Takotsubo as a cause um, for whatever reason. In terms of the mitral valve, the um, septal leaflet looks like it's got good excursion, but the other leaflet to me doesn't look like it's opening as well, just as a bit of a qualitative look, um, which is probably similar to what you think with that ECG in the chest yeah, pain. Yeah, so pretty typical ECG that you'd see for Takatsubo, so catecholamine associated. Um, Dysfunction, which in which here is apical, is not always apical, can be reversed, focal. But um, the important thing is we went a bit further with that assessment. It was it wasn't just what does contractility look like as well. Contractility at the base is probably okay, but contractility at the apex of the LV is is impaired, is ballooned, isn't it? But the right side looks okay, and you can get right side involvement with Takatsubo, and that's a terrible place to be. But certainly this, by just asking a few more questions and looking, looking at a little bit more sort of focal way, allows us to actually look, think about the diagnosis. Because this is what you're getting. The one on the left, uh, ventriculogram in end diastole, B systole, and you're seeing that apical ballooning. Um, postulated, because that's where there's more beta adrenoreceptors. Um, an interesting case like this, I didn't put that case out there by saying, oh, this lady's presented following some bad news or, a, a, you know, a highly stressful emotive situation, because sure, that can happen, but a third of cases, there's going to be no clear precipitant at all. So emotional stressors, physical stressors, surgery, pain, trauma, all possible, really common finding if you're doing echo in ICU as well sort of post-cardiac arrest, those with respiratory infections, endocrine abnormalities. So the problem here is pump failure. You obviously got to exclude occlusive MI. And then if there's a clear trigger, treat the underlying cause, but then the medical treatment becomes a little bit more tricky. So this lady's shocked and she's got pump failure with apical ballooning. Can How we just are we going to pause there, Jimmy, for one sec? Just for everybody, we've made an assumption that everyone knows what Takotsubo is. Uh, is that a di does anyone need an explanation? Terry Sadowski's not in the room to translate that for us, but does anyone know a bit of Japanese? Heartbreak syndrome. Heartbreak syndrome. But Takotsubo itself is octopus trap, which, if you look at the ventricular gram in B on the right hand side, the clay pots used traditionally to catch octopus look in that similar way, narrow neck, bulb kind of thing. It's baited. The octopus, as clever as they are, climb in, can't get out. And it's that kind of visual representation of that's what the ventricular look, gram looks like is the uh, octopus trap, and that's where the name comes from. But it is a, um, a cardiomyopathy based on kind of a high adrenal state. Just as a little aside. So given the fact that we think the catecholamines are part of the pathophysiology of this condition, how are we going to manage this patient? And where did I say they were? They were in 
Right. Right. Okay. Treatment options here. Right. <laughs> Just tell them to calm down, yeah? yeah Just calm down. Calm down. We'll get, we'll get better. Which it may do, but do they need any bridge, any therapy to bridge them to recovery? <laughs> so the transfer to North Shore for an angiogram for exclusion of occlusive MI sounds like a good idea. How are we going to manage their shock? What's the, what's the etiology of their shock? Like, why are they shocked? Well, I want to see it. I want to. I'd want to have a look at the LBOT. Yeah, so okay. really know. We can look at that a bit later. Yeah, because yeah. it could be one of two things. It's either that the pump sucks yep. or there's LBOT obstruction. Yep. Cool. So in the, this the trigger is different. Yeah, so in this case, the LBOT is okay. So the pump has failed. So how are we going to manage pump failure in this? What don't we want to give them? Or what do we want to be judicious about? <laughs> so it's a catechol excess problem, perhaps, Jimmy. Yes. How would you manage it then, Chris? Or would you like to select someone from the crowd to help you manage it? I'm happy to. Oh, so I guess these are really tricky, right? Um, sure. In my mind, it's trying to improve hemodynamic support. You have to still acknowledge you need uh, coronary perfusion because it is a diagnosis of exclusion to the cardiologist shoot the coronaries and show there is no obstructive lesion. So we've got a responsibility to bolster the afterload and uh, improve aortic root pressure. Finding a non catechol uh, vasoconstrictor is probably the right thing in my mind. Um, so, you know, you might need some noradrenaline in this instance, but maybe something like vasopressin or other agents, something with more alpha, less beta, is what I'm thinking. Maybe non uh, non catechol in uh, in at all. So vasopressin. They, in my experience, have seen a couple of these that need balloon pumps uh, as alternate support as well. Uh, Just wondering, as a non-catecholamine-based uh, inotrope, is milrinone an option for these patients? Uh, Hard to titrate, but... Yeah, true. Uh, on, the, also on the list of agents to consider, mm -hmm. as is levosimendin. Yeah. Some case reports of like high-dose insulin euglycemia being used in this case as well, which I think is a really good thing for retrieval teams to keep in mind, depending on where you're going to, because that's a really ubiquitous medication you may go to somewhere that has doesn't have those medications but they're going to have some insulin um so those options then obviously chris started talking about mechanical circulatory uh, support as well as a bridge to recovery chris i think is just going to talk through this case because i think this is a little yeah. nugget of his and i th i think addressing the underlying cause is often tricky but this is a North Shore case that uh, I think Jeff or Brian shared with me for the purpose of an alternate talk. But this was a 60-ish year old female involved in a high-speed motor vehicle collision who was shocked in the recess bay, had no uh, cause of hemorrhage identified, no obstructive shock. And at the end of their trauma evaluation from imaging, they were still profoundly shocked. And this is the echo that we that we got at the time. Uh, so the uh, innate kind of catechol surge of wrecking your car on the M1 at high speed can produce this. I've seen it in, um, in the same demographic as victims of domestic violence with lots of superficial injuries and profound shock and they've got the patterned ECG changes and this echo clip as well. So it's worth having a look and seeing this pattern. That was why I put this one in. Yeah. So, it's always worthwhile to include that under the chat of the shock patient. We routinely propose that our reference is a routine shock trials and stuff that is trying to exclude other forces of non responsive. And this is a great example. We've done that in the policy that nobody else for this patient. Have a 
go on to the third case that will bring us into a, a fourth, which is quite an interesting discussion. So they're all P1s. Um, another P1, helicopter job this will be, Bega to St George, 65-year-old male, past history of hypertension, uh, diabetes, uh, benign prostatic hypertrophy, and they think he's got urosepsis because he's had three days of dysuria, fever, and flank pain. Sounds pretty typical. Maybe he does, but maybe there's something else going on too. And they've treated him with some antibiotics. Then giving him a little bit of fluid, 500 mils. They've started an adrenaline infusion that's running at a fair dose. Um, and on the phone, the SRC is advised, well, they need to put in the CBC and start noradrenaline. But because we're doing a talk about the importance of focused echo in undifferentiated shock and shock non-responders, when you get there and the blood pressure and heart rate are just the same, you're going to do an echo. And this is it. There's a hand, this video comes with a handy little um, hand that wanders around to point out some of the pathology. <laughs> so sure, there's an area of interest there, but we'll talk through it in a bit more. What's contractility like? Pretty good, isn't it? Um, the ch yeah. Well, yeah, so it is. So the, the LV wall itself is, is hypertrophied and, and thickened. Um, the, there's a one point, like in systole, like there's not a lot of chamber left, is there? So actually some of the, the chamber size is reduced, is obliterated, so normal. Is there a pericardial effusion? Yeah, there is. Trace. Trace, trace posterior, but not significant. But there's a little posterior pericardial effusion there. Um, what about this? that septum? That's big, isn't it? So six mils to 10 mils would be normal. That looks big to me. And what about the mitral valve? Yeah, so it does so good excursion touch the septum. That's good when we're seeing it contracting and opening during the right phase of the cardiac cycle. That often that, that E point septal separation or the distance between the tip of the mitral valve and the intraventricular septum, if that's low, you know, that that's that's good. Um, when does the mitral valve normally open? When is it open here? Sam. You got some Sam. Yeah. So it's tricky. So there's another case here, and it, look, it looks good here as well, but it, it, I think it, I, it exemplifies these things even more. Look at the size of that myocardium. It is ridiculously big. The chamber is completely obliterated, but it's still contracting quite vigorously. Uh, there is also a, a trace pericardial effusion in this patient as well. It's, it's just a bigger version of the same. But you've got that. Systolic, as, as Cliff said, Sam, systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. The mitral valve is moving towards the interventricular septum during systole, and therefore there's two things that that causes. So that is going to cause obstruction to outflow through the left ventricular outflow tract, and it's going to cause mitral regurgitation as well, and pulmonary edema. So this is super tricky. Because the valve itself looks normal, but are you happy, particularly on that really slowed down version in the bottom left, that during systole, you know, the chamber gets smaller, the, the myocardium contracts, but that that mitral valve comes up towards the interventricular septum and impedes flow through the left ventricular outflow tract. So this, there's a really complex way of you're putting Doppler, et cetera, waveforms on this but we've talked about doing things qualitative, haven't we? Just an eyeball assessment. Is everyone happy that they can see that? Because it's pretty tricky. Do you want me to go back and have a look at the bigger parasternal views? Yeah. Have a quick look through them again. And Chris, do you want to just, with your, um, with your laser pointer, just point some of these bits out to us? It might be easier to slow it down, Jimmy, if you want to just hit pause on that clip. And then you can drag, you can set the pace of it, it pulls it, it will progress bar, uh, and you can drag it slowly and probably identify that. That's what I was doing. That way we can 
slow it down. This is what you might need to do in real time, and particularly none of us are mapping our echoes to ECG in the same way that you do in your cardiac lab. Uh, for mine, I'm looking for the first time I see in the contraction of the ventricles to give the start of systole. And that's the point where you might see that upward deflection of the anterior mitral leaflet where it will act as well. Uh, I might just let it loop for a bit because yeah, it's pretty yeah, hard for me to do it. Yeah. So it acts as during, you'll see the walls and the ventricles start to come together at a point where you expect the mitral valves to be locked shut uh, and forming a shield back towards the left atrium. But instead, you're getting this um, paradoxical upward deflection of the anterior mitral leaflet into the LVOT because of the venturi effect and high flow going through. It's it dragged up, which impedes output through the outflow tract, but also shunts blood back towards the left atrium. You have two problems causing you have regurgitant flow, which can cause pulmonary edema. You also have impaired flow and less stroke volume going out through your uh, outflow track. Cool. I still think out of all the clips, this is the one we might just play this bottom left one, Jimmy. Uh, yeah. The best point. We might even just pause it right there. That upward deflection during systole, flow goes back the wrong way, and you just your cardiac output during that cycle. Really subtle. I don't think I've seen any pretty cases. It's something to really look forward to. Where yeah, I mean, I guess it's important because it's. You know, paradoxically, this is th this patient. If they just keep doing what they were doing, it's going to get worse. Um, yeah. So you're going to have patients walking around with uh, LV hypertrophy related to. You know, hi, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, other hi, other cardiomyopathies, hypertensive cardiomyopathies, um, and they might be walking around without any knowledge of this, and then they get unwell with an intercurrent illness, and then this is unmasked. So, volume depletion, tachycardia, they can all be precipitants of this. LAD ischemia can be as well as um, as well as Takatsubo. And this is what um, Angus mentioned. This will really stuff you up. This is really tricky. So I have a look at this view. This was this was the best view I could find, but I think it identifies it nicely. So um, anyone want to tell us what's going on there? Or we want to do it stepwise again. So what view is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what's the contractility like? I don't know. Oh, oh. Um, what's, the, what's the contractility like? Basally, it's good, but apically... Basically, it's good, but apically, it's not. Yeah, it's hypokinetic. So you've got that Takatsuba pattern we already mentioned. But what about the mitral valve here? Hmm. Yeah. So there's some stat. So that anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is moving anteriorly during systole. So you have Takatsuba with pump failure, but you also have impairment of LV outflow, and you also have yeah. mitral regurg. There you go. Start of basal contraction and the valves. Question was just about uh, slowing down the replay on the IVIS. I think if you just hit pause and you can skip forward, uh, almost like doing mini chapters on a DVD player, and we just go step slide by slide, similar to what we're doing here, is the best way I've found to achieve that. What's the DVD? 
<laughs> it was a way of watching movies in the uh, twin in the noughties. <laughs> and, and 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 this is why it's important because as Angus said, it changes what we do. So. This is taken from takatsubo.net, which is a wealth of information about Takatsubo. But the important thing is that is those on the right-hand side that we're going to be called to see, isn't it? Hypotensive with cardiogenic shock. And we really need to try and get an idea of, is this just primary pump failure? And then it's going to respond to mechanisms to try and increase contractility, but being cognizant of the need to reduce or avoid catecholamines? Or do we need to think about how we're going to manage it when it's associated with LVTO? And there, the treatment is different, so they might respond to more fluid. A short-acting beta blocker, being careful of the fact they're already hypotensive, and then looking at mechanical devices, but really important to avoid things that are going to reduce their, um, their preload and their afterload. So um, it, it's tricky, but I think all those things we've talked about so far, they're all things that our teams can pick up just by taking those questions further. They've all got dysfunctions of looking at their contractility, looking at if, if things are focal, if they're regional, um, and then looking at the valves and making an assessment of them by knowing what a normal one looks like and how it opens and closes and which phase of the cardiac cycle it opens and closes in and then identifying if something's not right. And there's always someone to ask second opinion if things aren't right. They're like, hey, look, I've taken these echo clips. What do you think? Jeff's got his hand up. Can I ask a question? How do you refer to the combined psychocardial rehabilitation on the bottom of the screen? Do they review the patients within 24 hours? You're not sure about that. To be honest, uh, if I have my time again, I'd probably just zoom in on that top section of that <laughs> slide. <laughs> we'll move on to the next case. Uh, cautious that we're coming out of uh, coming up to time. Um, so I got two more cases here, but this is the most important one, I think. Uh, so this is a I want you now to use your mind's eye and and think about what you think this gentleman's uh, echo is going to look like when you're now belting down to Fairfield for a P1 83-year-old gentleman who was just around the corner in his home uh, when he presented with just a vague sense of unease and some mild chest discomfort, uh, walked out to the ambulance with a history of previous bypass surgery five years earlier, post-op PE, and he's on anticoagulation. And then as he's getting his 12 lead ECG with the, uh, with the uh, paramedics, he becomes unconscious. He has a rapid burst of tachycardia and then he becomes profoundly shocked with a heart rate uh, of about 30 initially and an unrecordable blood pressure. And he's now unconscious. So um, the paramedics nearby are brought into Fairfield, but not before they place a laryngeal mask with good end tidal CO2, um, get a cannula and start a peripheral adrenaline infusion. Um, and by the time you arrive at Fairfield, he's got a standard concentration of four in 50 adrenaline running at 43 mils an hour peripherally. Um, we've applied our alpaca approach and you're gonna put a probe on. Okay, bradycardic, shocked elderly gentleman with history of thromboembolism and cabbage. You've got a mental image of what this guy's heart's going to look like? I had it when I visited this gentleman. Here's his clip. <laughs> Did anyone picture that that's what it was going to look like? No. So... Where's the problem? Is it the left heart? No. Is it the right heart? Yeah. What specific anatomical part of the right heart is 
causing this catastrophic cardiovascular emergency. <laughs> yeah. And you're left with it. What do we think then of the right ventricle? <laughs> we haven't seen a smaller, more uh, uh, empty right ventricle today, have we? It's completely empty. It's trying to contract, but there's nothing to move forward. Um, we can see maybe a little whimper of tricuspid movement just above that big echogenic material in the right atrium. And as a result, I think just a, the profound shock state, the LV doesn't look like it's doing very much at all either, does it? What's the cause of this? What's the origin of this big echogenic something or other in the right atrium? Potentially. What is it? I don't know. What could it be? Yeah, tumor. tumor, clot, vegetation. It's hard for us to tell, isn't it? So I guess you go and look, he's got a history of thromboembolism. He's not clearly alert enough to give us uh, a history about his compliance with his anticoagulation. So we went looking elsewhere and we scanned his groins very quickly and his femoral veins looked okay. Because this is recorded, I didn't put the clinical image of this gentleman's appearance from the end of the bed, but as you walk into the room at Fairfield, what you see is a blue plethoric head with a IJ and EJ that is enormous. Looks like the M5 tunnel. Um, and so... You didn't show him. Is that because you shouldn't show images of people without their consent? Correct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is his IJ. <laughs> <laughs> what do we think that is? This is an IJ. Is it thrombus? Could it be thrombus? How could we tell? Yeah, so this can press down easily. Um, but the initial thought was, oh, this is a whopper. He's thrombosed his entire... Um, superior vena cava territory, but this was compressible. And this is, I think, just a testament of absolutely sluggish flow and almost a near complete uh, occlusion of preload into the circulation. Um, and what we thought was uh, complete. Correct. And what we thought was going to then just be near complete uh, tricuspid occlusion as a rare cause of cardiogenic shock. What are you going to do? So thrombolysis, perhaps. Good. What are our? We'll just discuss some of the options first before I tell you the end result here. Thrombolysis. If it's a, if it is a something, th um, if it is clot, that might be helpful. We might just need a whisper of increased flow through that valve to suddenly bolster some form of flow through the pulmonary circulation through to the left heart. Any other ideas? What if he was 53 and this was a de novo presentation and he just happened to have a collapse in his... Uh, urban district, non-tertiary hospital. What if he was 53? Yeah. yeah. We need to bypass his circulation until we can get to definitive care, which is cardiothoracics. And then truly at that point, they'll identify what that big mongrel of a right atrial something or other is. Any other ideas? Yeah, and I think that was the approach we... At this point, this gentleman didn't lose cardiac output at any point, surprisingly. We kept his adrenaline infusion bolstering up and up while we had a family conference. We did, waiting for the family, uh, thrombolise him. We actually put a central line into that IJ uh, and thrombolised down the central line. 
But what was interesting was at the point you, the, the nursing staff had drawn up his thrombolytic dose into a large syringe. And as that was pushed, we kept an echo clip and at no point did we see any bubbles going through his right from his pulmonary, uh, sorry, through his right circulation into that RV. So there's very little flow going across that whatsoever. And that was the point we got some story that we should just keep him comfortable and let bring the family in. Um, not necessarily a tricky diagnosis, but probably in my career, one of the most divergent episodes of imagining what I think the heart will look like and getting a really damn rude shock when I actually put the probe on. Um, but thankfully it was in a tertiary hospital with a few other people around to just help me overcome my biases and push forward with a few other bright ideas while we made a sensible decision. Do you think of putting the wire back through the semi-line and just putting the there and just shaking it violently? We, <laughs> keeping the stiff wire down. And the only other thing I thought about afterwards was if this was mass, you know, there's been, I think this gentleman walked out to his ambulance. Some, if that is tumour or something solid, I think it's moved and come up like a marble against, you know, and, and wedged there during that. I wondered, you know, if it was a more salvageable uh, patient that you might want to be more aggressive with, Was could we have done some postural change to try and improve that? I have no idea. But maybe going head down and seeing if that marble rolled off the valve, I have, I'm not sure, and that's my only what if about this case. Um, I think that you brings us... Cool. So I think if I'm going to summarise this morning, Jimmy's put a lot of awesome work into the front of this presentation to just really highlight that we can ask so many more finessed questions when we do it. Do we? I think this just reinforces uh, something that Angus had introduced in his, so it'd be very quick. Auburn to Westmead, 3am, uh, which was what I had. Uh, for a 53-year-old female who is, for all accounts, septic, severe abdominal pain, peritonism, fever, raised inflammatory markers, and shock that's refractory to uh, a reasonable volume of fluids, 1,500 mils of crystalloid given, um, a peripheral metaraminol infusion uh, accepted for surgeons and intensive care at Westmead, and you note the significant history of lupus on uh, 10 milligrams a day of prednisolone. So a number of reasons why this person might have shock that's fluid refractory, and it seems like a good idea to put an echo probe on. Mental image for each of you now, septic 53-year-old, um, some form of likely adrenal suppression, fluid refractory shock. We've all got our image? Okay. There's a heart. Immediate thoughts around the room. Is it a right heart or a left heart problem? Or do you want more information? Another view. So you turn your probe 90 degrees on its current axis. Have we got a donut and a croissant? And great visualization on that slide. Hold on. What's the problem here? Yeah, we've got a problem with interventricular dependence. The, L, the RV is now winning with volume and pressure and it's flattened the septum and it's squashing down our LV. Why have we got a right heart problem? Probably some unrecognised pulmonary hypertension with a lupus lung disease that was previously undiagnosed. Uh, because she's been relatively well maintained in the community and she's on a good dose of PRED. And she'd already had stress dose hydrocortisone, um, but perhaps that 1,500 mils of fluid has done some harm more than anything else. So this comes down to some of the stuff that Angus had alluded to before, and it's just a representation. So I'll get Jimmy, if you've got your laser pointer there, mate, to just point out some of the pertinent features here that that right ventricle is double the size of its left-sided neighbour, isn't it? Uh, it's really bowing out. 
We've got the septum between the two bowing in from le uh, from right to left, impinging on the LV chamber size and therefore the effective stroke volume on that. The tricuspid annulus is not moving in any great detail in a vertical plane in the de in the manner in which you would expect for a hyperdynamic septic person with an otherwise healthy heart. And you've got big bowing of the free wall of the right ventricle that's not really contracting inwards at all. Um, so it looks like, to me, a volume overloaded um, and pressure overloaded right ventricle. But let's just think about the chronicity of this. Does that RV free wall look to be a norm? What do we think about the musculature of that RV free wall? It's pretty thick, isn't it? It almost looks like you would expect a normal, healthy LV to look like. So we've probably got someone with a degree of long-standing pulmonary hypertension and some RV hypertrophy as a result of that, which gives a clue to a chronicity of this disease with an acute deterioration because of the intercurrent problem and some of the unfortunate treatment effects of uh, managing this type of patient blindly, blindly without echo, I mean. And then just the final thing, it's not hard, as Jimmy alluded to um, with the valvular stuff before, to just put a colour box across the valve that you're interested in and you can see a reasonably moderate tricuspid regurgitant jet there going from the RV to the RA, almost hitting the back wall. So I've talked enough about how to manage these cases of RV failure and pulmonary hypertension, but this was just the case not knowing uh, Angus's content that we just thought we'd add in as a visual representation of how helpful echo could be in those undifferentiated shocks or the shocks that aren't responding to the usual therapy when you're working blindly. And that's all from Jimmy and I. Are there any questions? So worth that extra pause, look at the valves. Are the valves looking healthy, unhealthy? Are they functioning normally? And what is the pattern of contractility? Not only is the overall function good, but what's the distribution of that function? Is it regional? Is it patterned? Um, and keep our eye on that anterior mitral leaflet. Carl. Um, some amazing videos. Thanks very much for putting them together. Um, I just want to just uh, remind everyone that that's a great example of uh, our role in retrieval. It's not simply to move the per person or whatever therapies that have been decided, but to, to diagnose, to treat, to change treatment, to change destination. And we see it so often in, in coughing cases where we're talking about we've come to a patient and everyone's decided what's wrong with them, and now we can bring a whole different level of expertise and make a new diagnosis, change the treatment and have a bit, much better, better outcome. Um, and the echo is essential in these shocked patients. Uh, we really need to be putting the echo probe on each one of them.